Soul Twin Audios, stories created solely with the vintage soul in mind. The thoughts and opinions regarding Dark Shadows and Strange Paradise are my own. While I might express a dislike for a certain segment from either soap, you will not hear me bashing any actor on either series or completely trashing any of the storylines. My aim is to be as respectful and professional as possible, as I know fans can get very personal about their favorites. Please keep this in mind if you leave a comment on YouTube or any of the other platforms for this podcast. A wailing storm sweeps over Collinwood and Mel Jardin. Two cursed dwellings about to plunge further into darkness as one man emerges from his tomb with evil intentions, while another makes a Faustian bargain to be reunited with his love, releasing a dark entity guaranteed to invoke terror by those who come across his path. Wait, I... I think I'm lost. But wait, there looks like there's somebody in there. Maybe he can... Hey, you wouldn't happen to know the way to the... Wait, you're not actually going to open that, are you? You're you're not, right? You're not going to open I mean, it's a coffin, which is creepy enough, and it's got chains on it, and that's... Isn't that what, three padlocks? Someone obviously doesn't want you to... Seriously, I think you need to reconsider. Okay, well, I'm, I'm out of here. Good luck to you. I knew he wouldn't listen to me. The arrival of Barnabas Collins, featuring Penny Dreadful, host of the Terror at Collinwood podcast. Well, Rachel, first, thank you very much for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. And uh, you're doing such a great job with your show. And I enjoyed your first episode. So I look forward to many more episodes from you. Um, But uh, my introduction to Dark Shadows was... uh, the through my uncle Valdemar, and ever since I, you know, when I my earliest memories, he uh, would give me his famous Monsters of Filmland magazines, including issue number fifty nine with that beautiful Basil Gogos Barnabas painting on the cover, and uh, fam- and the bubble gum cards that he had, and he'd tell me stories about dark shadows. So um, I knew who Barnabas was, you know, from from the beginning. Uh, but the first episodes I watched uh, were in nineteen eighty two. My uncle managed to get some um, syndicated VHS tape copies of um, those those specific episodes, the introduction of Barnabas. So anytime someone says Dark Shadows to me, my mind immediately flashes to the introduction of Barnabas storyline because that was those were the first episodes I watched. And I was hooked when that hand reached out of the coffin and grabbed Willie Loomis by the throat It grabbed me by the throat, too, Um, and I I could not get enough. And I had terrible nightmares about Barnabas. I had horrible nightmares, but I I wanted to keep watching it. I I had to come back for more. I was definitely hooked. I actually watched the show starting, I want to say, in 1992. Mm -hmm. So I was about 12 or so, and I didn't get to watch those first Barnabas episodes. I started in 1795, and my first episode... Yeah, my first episode was when um, Angelique was trying to choke Barnabas out with that voodoo. What? Well, wait, was it a voodoo doll? Or, no, no, it was the toy soldier, the right? Toy soldier, yeah, right, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. That wow. was that was my first experience, and I remember being confused, not knowing really what was going on, and I'm like, what? What the heck is? Uh, what the heck is this? And yeah. um, so that was kind of my first experience, and then I had mentioned it to um 
my mom's partner that I started watching this weird show called Dark Shadows. And she's like, oh, that's the show with Barnabas Collins. It's like every other soap opera. But, you know, every once in a while, Barnabas will bite somebody. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so it's 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 interesting because, I mean, you you start with Barnabas. He gets released from the coffin and he's completely evil mm -hmm. or rather he appears to be evil. And yet he's still like that charismatic, charismatic guy. Um, so for me, it was weird because I didn't see him as evil until probably, well, when they got back and then, and then he was kind of manipulative and stuff, but he didn't seem evil to me until the Leviathan storyline. Mm hmm yeah, there was no, <laughs> there were no redeeming qualities to to Barnabas in the Leviathan storyline. The early Barnabas episodes, that introduction of Barnabas storyline, even though he was evil, uh, you know, he still, I remember watching those episodes and still feeling, because Jonathan Frid was so great at infusing that character with elements of sadness. There was a, there was a deep melancholy to Barnabas, like a, a sense of of yearning and even in those early episodes and you start to see it even more when sarah shows up and she's appearing to everyone except for barnabas collins and um i remember being feeling even though i was scared of barnabas and thought he was horrible uh he all uh, you know a, a monster but he also there was a sense of um of underneath that a little bit of a hint of a of of a conscience or or a yearning for his humanity and i think sarah kind of symbolized that that lost innocence you know um that that eluded him now uh and so even then even though he was awful and did awful things there was still that i think that the audience was connecting with that i remember even as a child i was like picking up on that yeah that was that was a kind of a bittersweet episode when she appears because as you mm -hmm. said it it is kind of a loss of innocence and when she appeared and maybe that really was his wake-up call when she showed up and said um that wicked is oh maybe you can remember how it goes exactly something about the, wicked um is... that evil which um, is evil uh, how does oh that gosh go? <laughs> it's well understood the wicked are punished, so you so must, you be, must good. be good, right? That, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. It was so, yeah. yeah, something to that effect. I'm we're probably butchering it there, but I'm probably butchering it too. The evil but, that yeah. evil is something is yeah, well the, understood. That, yeah, that evil is wicked is well understood. The evil are punished. Yeah, so you, so you, so must, you must be, be good. good. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, and, and then, then she, uh, yeah, and then, she, and then she threatens to to leave forever if he doesn't mm -hmm. change his way and i know we're kind of going all over the place here um but i kind of wondered from a storyline standpoint why she didn't return and is it because he was still doing evil things uh or i mean obviously they just decided to switch actresses they went with the amy jim and amy jennings stuff but I just I wonder why her storyline just kind of wrapped up. Well, I mean, I, I I've mentioned this on my podcast before too. I mean, she does never she never does come back. And I mean, the real life reason is that Sharon Smith was getting older and and she was let go from the show after 1795. But um, but I think I mean they probably could have recast and had another little girl play Sarah and come back. She never did. And Barnabas, I, I love Barnabas Collins, but Barnabas. I think a lot of fans tend to be very forgiving of Barnabas, but he continues to be a murderer. <laughs> well, right. And it is the, I mean, yes, you can say it's the curse that's driving him to do that, but he's, he seems to take some satisfaction in, in at times and in, throughout the series. I mean, in, in committing some, he's the hero of, he becomes the protagonist of the show, but Barnabas, you know, his body count is significantly higher than anyone else's, maybe except for Angelique, uh, right. or at least tied. So, you know, um, maybe uh, Sarah didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think eventually, maybe she would have come back if he had finally sort of, um, you know, 
maybe if if he had fully sort of um, repented, you know, I guess, and all the bad things that he had done in the past. I don't know. Um, but um, but it's, you know, he was under a curse. He was doing some pretty horrible things. Um, and even when he wasn't cursed at times, he was, sometimes would do some questionable things too. So, I mean, Sarah was a very sweet, innocent being. Um, so she probably, maybe she, he, he wasn't ready for Sarah to come back uh, yet. <laughs> That's possible. What was your favorite interaction that Barnabas had with a different character? I probably would say Willie Loomis, but I was just wondering what your thoughts were there. Um, with a different character, um, I, I Willie is definitely up there. Uh, Doctor Julia Hoffman, uh, absolutely. I love the sort of the the sparring between the two of them, especially early on, where she's kind of matches him. You know, she she's human, but she's able to kind of stand toe to toe with Barnabas and, and confront him about what he is. And then also offer to cure him. Uh, I, I think, and then he's very mistrustful of that. And that sort of, I don't know, back and forth between the two of them is, is interesting to watch and create some really great, um, tension and drama. Um, uh, and I also enjoy seeing, um, you know, just I love the contrast of Barnabas interacting with the Collins family, with Elizabeth and Roger, et cetera. Uh, and then the Barnabas you see when he's with Willie and Julia is a very, is a different Barnabas. You know, it's there. He, he's that very friendly, genteel Barnabas in front of the family, but uh, it's that two sides of, of his personality that we see. So, um, but yeah, pro I would say probably Willie and Julia, def that's kind of, you see the real, Barnabas, I guess there, uh, or more of the real Barnabas, there is the full personality with the two of them. Right. <clears throat> what about um, his, you, we mentioned his body count earlier. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, which, which victim of Barnabas do you think is the, the one you, you really didn't want to see die? I mean, I, I guess I guess one could argue that he was responsible for various deaths, even even if he didn't actually bite that person, yeah, like, like indirectly. Like I mean, I would venture to say that he was indirectly, in a small way, responsible for Rachel Drummond's death because he turned Burke into a, a vampire Dirk into a vampire basically agreed yeah yeah it was an indirect yeah indirectly responsible for it for sure um and in other cases where he shared responsibility with Angelique like Roxanne in 1840 um you know he initial he initiated the um attacks on Roxanne and then when he stopped Angelique just used a voodoo doll to open the wounds up so uh they sort of teamed up on <laughs> That was an inadvertent tag team effort there. Uh, but I, the one I'm the most that that made me the saddest was for sure Carl Collins. Um, I really thought, you know, Carl could be obnoxious, mm -hmm. but he was he was sweet. He was he was just a, a immature prankster member of the Collins family. He was kind of everyone else was so, you know, uh, uh, Judith and Edward were very stuffy and formal. And um, of course, Quentin was the rogue. But Carl was just this goofball character. And then he finally, you know, found the love of his life with Pansy Faye. And she's she's murdered. And then poor Carl, he discovers Barnabas's secret. And I, I mean, it was a, an act of self-preservation. If you find out Barnabas's secret, you die. That's 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 his go-to is is killing off, you know, somebody finds out a secret. And I felt like, and that was also. You know, his Barnabas is there to help the Collins family in the future save David Collins, and yet he's murders a member of the Collins family and and effectively alters history in doing so. Uh, because we don't, I mean, maybe Carl died of some other cause in the original run of events, but it certainly wasn't because Barnabas strangled him to death in the original right. run of 1897. So I would say, Carl, how about you? Oh my gosh. Um, Honestly, uh, as far as victims go, I I probably would have to see Rachel Drummond, mm -hmm. only because I wanted to see her end up with Tim Shaw. And oh, it just yeah. never happened. Yeah, you yeah. know. 
Um, but I suppose we sh we should, since this is introduction to Barnabas, we really should talk a little bit about Barnabas and Maggie Evans and that whole mm. issue. Um, I I thought it was interesting that Maggie was supposed to be the reincarnation of Josette when they started off with Victoria as mm. the reincarnation or at least in the 1991 series but i mean what was your opinion i mean what, was, what what are your thoughts when the whole kidnapping of maggie evans took place and i mean he just he really did become this evil mustache twirling kind of a villain for a while mm -hmm. um it was um it's it's a terrifying sequence i mean this is classic vampire movie material i mean this is was a very um uh horrific thing that barnabas did um and it's it's awful what he did there's no there is no for forgiving that i think i mean he i mean you he was obsessed with josette and he saw josette and maggie evans which was an interesting twist because you would think they would go with Victoria Winters, um, but a fan of who listens to my podcast wrote in and suggested that he thought that um, it was going to be like a Vicky was going to be the Mina Harker, and uh, that Maggie was going to be the Lucy, and he thought Lucy, that Maggie would eventually have been turned into a vampire. I I don't know if that's the case, uh, if that's what the writers had planned, but it is. It was certainly an unexpected thing and a great way to work in Maggie's character into the storyline and make her a more uh, prominent character in the storyline. Um, although then Vicky kind of gets a little bit sidelined when that's going on. Uh, and then she becomes the next focus for Barnabas. But it's terrible what Barnabas did to Maggie Evans. And one of the, the greatest sequences in the show is later on in uh, in 1968. Maggie re re remembers what Barnabas mm -hmm. did to her, and I thought that was very a very compelling storyline. Um, it would have been great to see her confront Barnabas too about about that. Um, you know, th that's that's you know a very monstrous thing that barnabas did and i again like i said a lot of fans are forgiving of barnabas because you see his origin story and you do see that he's not he was not a monster he was actually a pretty nice guy for the most well for the most part you know mm -hmm. uh for the most part the anti-hero yeah yes and he does become the anti-hero of the show but what he did there was was terrifying especially when maggie escapes and there's the, the entire scene where barnabas is following her through um these catacombs and underneath the old house it's i mean it's right out of a universal horror movie it's it's really scary stuff but great and very captivating uh you know it's he's a vampire of course he's scary you know mm -hmm. that's you don't want to ever nerf the vampire you know he has barnabas has to have an edge when Barnabas doesn't have an edge, he's just, he's not as interesting because it's interesting that he's frightening and unpredictable. He, but even when he's, he becomes the hero of the show, he's still a vampire. So he's still dangerous. Um, and I think that's really at the forefront in this storyline uh, to the point where he's awful. You know, you don't, you're not rooting for Barnabas. You, you obviously want Maggie to, to escape her fate. Um, and this is where also where we start to love Willie too, because Willie, sees what kind of a monster he's dealing with here and that he's on in his thrall and Willie is wants to help Maggie, but he, he can't, he's, he's in Barnabas's thrall. Um, so it's, I mean, it's great stuff. I think it drama wise, it's fascinating to watch. I, I definitely agree. In fact, I, I think, uh, and I could be wrong about this, but I think big finish explored mm -hmm. Maggie, Maggie confronting, Oh Barnabas. yeah, at least in one of the um, Kingdom of the Dead, it was King in Kingdom of the Dead. She she confronts Barnabas in that, and uh, and Willie too, both of them. Um, and it was it was great. Uh, it, that was that was a really Kingdom of the Dead is probably one of my favorite of the Big Finish. It's like a, a box set with David Warner was in it and stuff. It was great. I'm gonna have to re-listen to that. I know I've listened to all of that, but there's a bunch of them I haven't heard and. There's so many. Definitely yeah. have to do a re-listen of that. Mm -hmm. Um. Oh gosh, we could just 
talk here all day. No, I want to ask you a question. I want to, sure. if you don't mind, did you discover uh, Dark Shadows first or Strange Paradise first? Because everybody I know is, you know, that has watched Strange Paradise or it's knew of Dark Shadows first and then found Strange Paradise. Was it the other way around with you or? No, that's, that's actually true. I did. Okay. I did find out about Dark Shadows first, just mm -hmm. by accident. I, I, I'll never forget it. I was just flipping channels and, uh, came across the sci-fi channel. It was a snow day. I think mm -hmm. I was in seventh grade. Mm -hmm. And there it was, Angelique with the the toy soldier. Yeah. Yeah. And what about Strange Paradise? Strange Paradise. Um I'm trying to remember how I discovered it actually. I know it was some footnote in a Dark Shadows book. Mm -hmm. Um I think I just stumbled upon it one day or maybe maybe i did actively look for it because it was in a footnote and i wanted to see, i wanted to hear more about it mm -hmm. so i think that's probably what happened i actively looked for it i see so my my uncle the uncle valdemar who was you know, a huge monster kid and and introduced me to dark shadows and all the, the sort of the classic um, horror films he knew about strange paradise too he had somehow seen it at some point uh and back back then and he said oh there's a, there's another show strange paradise that's like like dark shadows like a canadian dark shadows i said really and I, at that time it wasn't on anywhere so i couldn't really find it but steve uh, actually it was steve shutt who you had as a guest the wonderful mm -hmm. steve shutt He's he wonderful. Oh, he is. Yeah. He years ago, he gave me a VHS tape. I remember I met up with my late husband and I went up to Salem and met Steve and he, um, he gave me a tape, uh, that of strange paradise episodes. So it was like a chunk of episodes. So I got mm -hmm. to finally got to watch strange paradise, which was really, I love Raxel. She was my favorite. Oh, she is from... the best. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I really enjoyed the ones that, that I saw, but, um, yeah. So yeah, that was one that it's like, kind of eluded me too. Like I knew it existed, but I didn't have access to it. After you watched 17, you watched 1795 and you went back and watched the early Barnabas ep episodes. Was that, that must have been very jarring for you. Huh? Like it to, was, to um, but I didn't get to see them until I started collecting the, uh, the DVDs. Mm -hmm. I had collected all of the DVDs and then I gave all of them away to somebody. And then I got a, um, the coffin set, which was, yeah, absolutely amazing because i mean yeah. you've got all of that great extra content along with the interviews along um the interviews at the end of each uh um, yeah each volume agreed yeah it's a, yeah those are those interviews are priceless are really really fantastic i do wish um just going back real quick to to sarah i do wish i think that would have been a great ending to the series like if they had done another after 1841 parallel time or something if they had come back to the present for just another month and maybe gotten another uh, little girl to play Sarah with dark hair and have just wrap that up and have her finally reappear to Barnabas just to give it some sense of, of closure for that. Uh, and maybe bring back Vicky with her too, because Vicky was the, right. the, the lead of the show, as you mentioned in your first um, episode, you know, Vicky was the lead of the show. Of course, Alexandra Moltke left the show and they did mm -hmm. a couple of recastings with her with Betsy Durkin and Carolyn Groves, but uh, we never really get any closure on Victoria Winters too, which is probably the biggest dangling plot line in, in, the, in the series is that Victoria Winters never gets, uh, we never find out about her parentage or any of that. And that would have been nice um, to have, but if they tried to get Alexandra to come back, but she, she wanted to play uh, a villain. Uh, mm -hmm. She wouldn't, <laughs> a villain or a vampire or something. She wanted, she wanted to do something more fun, which I, I don't blame her for. I don't, I don't blame her either. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, maybe they could have done like a parallel time, Victoria Winters, who was, who was a, a vampire or something but uh anyway yeah so i mean it, it does get i mean once uh, maggie escapes and they introduce dr hoffman and she's um you know f figures out barnabas is a vampire i mean i think that storyline it's it's unfortunate a lot i've tried to introduce f friends of mine to dark shadows years ago you know to try to introduce them to that storyline first and they it's a slow burn at first because you also have the Jason McGuire blackmail storyline going on at the same time concurrently. So, um, and it's, you know, the pacing 
by by today's standards, unfortunately, they they were finding it slow. So now I just have them watch 1897 as a starting point. But I love the slow burn of those episodes. And I think it just it it ramps up as things start to unfold after the kidnapping of Maggie and her escape. And then Julia Hoffman being introduced to the show. They keep adding these layers and complications to it. And then doc- the whole thing with Dr. Woodard, which was really tragic as well. Um, and uh, I was talking to Stuart Manning about this, about Dr. Woodard. And uh, I think if Peter, uh, if um, uh, Robert Geringer had stayed on the show and Peter Turgeon had not taken his place, I think the fans would have been, I don't know if they would have been as um, forgiving of Barnabas and Julia because Robert Geringer was a very likable actor and he was pretty well established already as Dr. Woodard, whereas Peter Turgeon was a, was a recast. He was a new actor in the show and maybe not as lovable, I guess, <laughs> as Robert Geringer. Although, although I remember being very, I was very uh, horrified by that. I was, I was stunned. Like I, my mouth fell open, you know, I was when I was a kid, when I first saw that, I still get chills thinking about that. And Barnabas, you know, him say, pointing and saying, Sarah, and then Barnabas was furious, you know, when he tried to use Sarah as a as a distraction to escape. And Barnabas says that line, uh, loathsome, loathsome I am and evil, you can mock me for that, but leave my pain alone. And then he just jabs <laughs> him with that needle. It was such a vicious wow. uh, s- murder, you know. Um, but I, I and I again, I think if that had been Robert Garinger, I, I don't know how I think fans would have been really upset about that. Uh, but it was, it was great television. I mean, it was just a, just a great, um, it was interesting and, and terrifying. And, it, and and I think, you know, Dark Shadows does draw its, or as you know, you know, from Gothic literature and it did go more from Gothic romance into Gothic horror um, or Gothic terror, I guess. But, you know, it's, it's, there's for, for a kid to watch that, I, w- I was scared watching that stuff and uh, and having nightmares. Looking back on it, it was a really uh, scary storyline, actually. Um, so yeah, there's there's some really interesting stuff happening there. Uh, but we like again, and then, oh, and of course Barnabas going uh, f- setting his sights on David too because of Sarah befriending David. That was that was uh, you know that was scary too. You know for because now the vampire is like. Uh, wants to kill the child it was horrifying you know it was, it was really scary stuff um but i i really uh did uh i do love that storyline a lot and again uh, i'm kind of focusing on like the scary stuff barnabas did but we do get those that those pangs of sadness and especially when he starts to focus on vicky as the next josette and he can't bring himself to bite vicky he doesn't want to harm Vicky because he actually genuinely does care about Vicky. I don't think he, he didn't have any feelings for Maggie. She just looked just like Josette, but he saw Vicky more as the, the this, you know, the purity that he saw in, in, um, in Josette. He saw that in, in Vicky as well somehow, you know, and he, he couldn't bring himself to bite Vicky, uh, at least not till we come back from 1795. Uh, so I thought you, you get these, hints you know that barnabas is there's a humanity there that jonathan frid and the writers were infusing and it wasn't just the marauding vampire that dan curtis probably would have preferred but the audience was connecting with those glimpses of conscience that we started to see with barnabas so uh, i think it's a really captivating storyline and it's the storyline that made that catapulted dark shadows into pop culture history. I mean, that that's that introduction of Barnabas Collins is what saved Dark Shadows. Uh, Although the ratings did start going back up with Laura, the Laura storyline. Laura storyline was was very good too. Um, But when we put it like a recognizable archetype, like a vampire on daytime television, which has never been done before. (laughs) It's just, you know, people were all the monster kids. We have to remember too, the monster craze was going on at this time too in the sixties, um, which I think doesn't get talked about enough too, in terms of the popularity of dark shadows. This was coming off the Aurora model kits and the, um, and the, the shock theater 
package of the horror host showing universal horror films on television. Um, there were, uh, you know, uh, famous monsters of film land. All of this stuff was in the zeitgeist at the time and dark shadows hit at the emp- epicenter of that. It, like it just really, uh, all those monster kids that love spooky stuff were l- running home from school to watch dark shadows because there were vampires and werewolves and ghosts and witches on TV. Uh, I mean, and I, I'm surprised that doesn't get brought up enough in articles about why Dark Shadows became a hit with kids, because that was going on at that time as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Like with the Adams Family and the Monsters. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. The Adams Family and the Monsters, too. Yep. Um, you know, that with Dark Shadows came right as those ended. Those ran from 64 to 66. And here comes Dark Shadows in 66, you know, uh, where but the Monsters in the Addams Family were, were comedic. Dark Shadows was uh, a drama. Ser- yeah, serious yeah. and dramatic. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much for joining me today and talk, talking about the arrival of Barnabas. I just really enjoyed our talk. Oh, Rachel, it was uh, my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Erica, my beloved, I'll make you live again. There are forces here, both ancient and evil, that you must not tempt to rise. I have found the way. Dare to fly in the face of God? On this island, I am God. Find me. It's the cult hit TV series, Strange Paradise, tonight on Drive In Classics. Possession of Jean-Paul Desmond, a discussion of Strange Paradise with Stephen Schutt. Well, thanks so much for having me on. Um, Like you said, I'm Steve Schutt, and I am an original fan of Strange Paradise. I started watching it 53 years ago in 1969. Golly, I feel like a dinosaur (laughs) saying that. (laughs) And um, I don't really remember much about the the ads that there must have been placed like in TV Guide. It was probably an ad in TV Guide that they probably had a picture and uh, Kurt Ladner has found some of those old ads that were used to promote the show and they would say things like, the world's richest man makes a pact with the devil to bring his wife back from the dead. And some of them would just dramatically announce the devil is eternal, which was one of the um, frequently uttered lines by Raxel, the mysterious housekeeper who became one of my favorite characters. And I didn't hear, I don't remember hearing anyone talk about it, but I have a very vivid memory of that first episode. It was early in September of 1969. And I remember I was in the basement of our house, the finished basement, like a lot of 60s homes. Um, We had a color TV down there and I was just immediately entranced by this show. And I wasn't sitting there thinking, oh, this is exactly like Dark Shadows, nor was I thinking, oh, this is like somebody's inept knockoff of Dark Shadows, which those are the two main things that you read about Strange Paradise on the internet. Yes. I, you know, it was, um, it was a videotape uh, in a kind of serial soap opera format, but so a lot of shows were like that at the time. So that didn't immediately make me think. What, what actually I was excited about was now I get an hour of gothic horror when I come home from school in the afternoon, not just half an hour, but a full hour. And that was really exciting to me. And when the music came up with the drums and the mysterious shot of Keto, the mute servant, is he or is he not a zombie? That was a question. Slowly trudging up the hill, bearing, what was he carrying? Two buckets full of dry ice. And it's very mysterious and there's the sound of wind howling. And um, then you find out that the attractive 
uh, master of, of Mao Zedong, Jean-Paul Desmond, the world's richest man, who like the way he was presented in the pilot, it kind of evoked people's, um, the media presence of a guy named Howard Hughes, who was the world's richest man, who was very eccentric and very reclusive and um, got up to a lot of shenanigans that were widely reported. And we didn't have People Magazine in the 60s, but we had other things. And the stuff that's said in the pilot about Jean-Paul and his wife, Erica, Erica Desmond, it's similar to the kinds of things that you would have read in magazines about Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor or other big media personalities. So, so that's how, how they were presented. And then there's this moment when Jean-Paul is in complete denial that his, the woman he loved most in the world has been taken from him. And somebody says, well, you must accept the will of God. And then he says, on this island, I am God. Oh, that's and the best line the, ever. There's a voice from off from nowhere that says, bravo. <laughs> 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 and who is that? That's the voice of his evil ancestor, Jacques and Roi de Mon. And what, when I was watching this uh, to review for this thing, it suddenly hit me, oh, in French, when you say demon, you say demon. So it actually sounds just like the surname, Jacques Elois Demon. And Cosette Lee, who, who incarnated Raxel so brilliantly, she's one of my favorite actresses, although that's almost the only thing I've ever seen her in. She always has this beat where she goes, Jacques Elois Demon. <laughs> and it's uh, <laughs> like, I, I don't. I think Elwa means something nice in French, but I, in my mind, from my high school French, I always think it means like the banished demon or something like that. Because she she always pauses, Jacques, Elwa de Monde, and it's so dramatic and theatrical. <laughs> and I just love the theatricality of the show. And then the other part that I wanted to mention in watching the pilot episode is um, the, the spirit has been imprisoned, the spirit of his ancestor has been imprisoned mysteriously and he guides him into the crypt. And then in this very scary scene for an 11 year old, it was scary, where he's going into this mysterious crypt that's underneath his castle. Um, meanwhile, it's counterpointed with a nightclub singer, Beryl Forbes, with other characters. And what is she performing? An oldie but goodie, that old black magic. So there are these shots of her singing that old black magic, while the character is also like counterpointed with performing black magic by opening a coffin, finding a voodoo doll and taking the pin out of the head. And it was just such a different, way of shooting something like that. I mean, as an 11 year old, I didn't have a very sophisticated response. In fact, I think I was so afraid when Jean-Paul opened the casket that I could, couldn't even stand to look because I thought it would be a grisly skeleton or something. And I looked around my hand and it's like, oh, it's a voodoo doll <laughs> mm -hmm. dressed in 17th century clothing. And um, and, and then, um, you know, it takes off from there, but I was immediately hooked. And um, it, of course it has sluggish moments as it goes along and there's a lot of recapping. So as with Dark Shadows, but perhaps even to a greater extent um, for, you know, the culture of watching video now, it's people binge, they want to like, spend hours watching something to get through it I guess or and mm -hmm. it doesn't really favor that so much it's it's nice to watch two or three episodes at a time but um but um I think if you try to binge it then you get into the problems that people have reported of oh there's so much recapping um, yes but um so that's that was how I got into the show and then then the mysterious part of it is that um, when it went off, um, when, when uh, the end of the Mao Jardin, so there's three arc, the three main arcs that each last 13 weeks. There's the Mao Jardin arc, 
It's named for the setting, the castle of Najadan, which means garden of evil. We mustn't forget that. Um, then the Desmond Hall number one arc and the Desmond Hall number two arc. And then that's the end of the show. So it's only 195 episodes, not over 1200 episodes like Dark Shadows. But um, usually people get bogged down in the early Mao Jardin arc because there's a lot of recapping. And uh, Kurt Labnier, whose blog is uh, such a wonderful resource, has done a lot of research and found out that the what the the writer the all of Dark Shadows at the uh, all of Strange Paradise at the beginning was um, being written by one person just like Dark Shadows was being written by Art Wallace at the beginning. At the beginning of Strange Paradise, it was all being written by Ian Martin. And he had carefully set up and, and um, thought through this storyline that was going to involve flashbacks to the 1680s. And then after about 20 episodes, the powers that be who ran the show uh, told him, uh, no, we can't do any more of these flashbacks. And uh, so the plan was for each of the characters to turn out to be the reincarnation of somebody from the 1680s. And then he wasn't allowed to do that storyline. So he had to scramble and come up with replacement story. And it was a lot of pressure. So I think that explains part of uh, how the early storyline um, stalled for a while. And then it picked up when he started working on the seance um, storyline. So that is an element that Dark Shadows and Strange Paradise share. There's a lot of seances. The spirit, obviously, of Jacques Allois de Mont has been around for 300 years. Mm -hmm. Why is he now just picking this moment when Jean-Paul's wife died to come and possess Jean-Paul and mess with him and everything. Why, why did he pick that moment? Why didn't he pick an earlier time? It's just something that I had on my mind. That's a really good question. And um, I think it was that Jean-Paul may have been the first person who denied God in the presence of the portrait of Jacques Wadimont. In The Portrait of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde, there's a moment where Dorian, in complete innocence, says, what if I could be young forever? And somehow that's also a moment of fate. I think the theme of fate is very important in Strange Paradise. And it's, as our friend Danielle would say in her Terror of Collinwood podcast, um, it's an element in many Gothic narratives, Gothic horror, Gothic suspense, the idea of fate. And it seems um, it's implied that Jean-Paul, um, his wife, Erica, and her sister, Alison, Dr. Alison Carr, are all reincarnations of people who lived on Mar Jardin in the 1680s. And somehow through the web of fate, in many cultures, there's the idea of fate being woven by these goddesses who are quite impersonal and don't really care about humans, but they're weaving this web of fate. And it seems like there's an element of fate in all these different people. And then Holly and her mother, the ingenue character, Holly and mm -hmm. her mother, the um, who's kind of the B-I-T-C-H character on <laughs> yes. Holy Strange Paradise, beautifully played by Paisley Maxwell, by the way. She mm -hmm. apparently was a really lovely, kind person in real life, but she plays a cold, conceited, rather heartless individual on the show. And they are also reincarnations of people who we would have found out more about if the... Um, producers hadn't decided, oh, we don't have the budget to do all these flashbacks. So I think that we all have free will, but at that moment in his despair, his grief at losing his wife, Jean-Paul denied God. And so that opened this space for that spirit. But it's obvious from, from what Jacques says to Jean-Paul that he's been able to witness certain things and possibly even to know things about what's going on in Jean-Paul's mind and it's kind of creepy. 
so basically he he was lying dormant waiting for that perfect moment and obviously Raxel who we we won't get too much into her today she um was basically keeping watch you know uh, keeping watch over uh Jean Paul and making sure that Jacques stayed in his lane yes <laughs> that's a good way of putting it the next um, thing that happened, which we're not going to really go into much now, is after episode 44, the original writer, Ian Martin, was dismissed. And Bob Costello, who had been the producer on Dark Shadows, but had left in 1969 due to what would now be called creative differences with Dan Curtis, came in to be to become the producer of Strange Paradise. And Unusually, we actually have a newspaper interview where Bob Costello talks about his perceptions of what's going wrong with Strange Paradise, because a number of the Metro Media affiliates in the U.S. that have been carrying it had dropped it. And um, he says, well, it's been this voodoo theme up till now, and we're going to like make it heavy occult with witches. And he mentions ESP, which isn't really that big a theme except for people having psychic flashes sometimes. Um, and he didn't even stay the producer of Strange Paradise until the end of the show. I think eventually there were further, it might have been budgetary problems, I don't know, but he did leave before the end. Mm -hmm. And um, But when he comes in, then it does become a little bit more like Dark Shadows because um, they just... They, they start doing the initial voiceovers for one thing that they don't do until episode 45. It starts with Bob Costello. So then you feel like you're watching something that's more like Dark Shadows because it starts out with the ominous voiceover and the, even the language of the voiceovers seems to echo the language of Dark Shadows, you know, in this brooding island of evil or garden of evil you know what new horror awaits that kind of thing um and i you know i actually enjoy when the voiceovers start and then after he leaves they stop again it's very ironic it starts out all being written by the same person with no voiceovers at the beginning and at the end it's again all being written by the same person, except the writer who's writing it at the end isn't nearly as um, sophisticated or talented. A right, he did grow into becoming an important, very important writer for soap operas. It's a guy named Harding LeMay. But the final episodes are all written by him. The plotting was probably done by somebody else. My theory is Ron Sprout, who was one of the Dark Shadows writers who uh, was, was brought in by Bob Costello. And um, it's kind of interesting. Actually, people on, online always talk about how Strange Paradise is somehow a knockoff of Dark Shadows, but actually the Dark Shadows writers, some of them seem to have been watching Strange Paradise because one of the um, things that they do at the very beginning for the demonic possession is when the when Jean Paul is possessed he wears this big knuckle duster ring and that's a, a cue to the audience that actually none of the characters comment on like oh Jean Paul suddenly you're wearing this enormous ring that you weren't wearing 30 seconds ago <laughs> yeah but it's always prominently shown to the the viewer that and I mean they don't really need to do that because Colin Fox just changes physically to such an incredible degree when he's being possessed. Uh, he's playing the, the possessed Jean Paul being possessed by Jacques Gawain de Monde. Um, and, and right around the time, like just a couple weeks after that episode would have been aired in New York, they do this Count Patafi, Quentin Collins mind switch on Dark Shadows. Right. Where it's a ring. That, you know, there's a big knuckle duster ring that Count Patapi slips on Quentin Collins's hand. And that's the beginning of the mind switch. The ring is enchanted and the Count uses it to transfer his consciousness into Quentin's body. 
And um, I, you know, for some reason, Dark Shadows fans never pick up on that. And then in the later storyline, when uh, one of the Dark Shadows writers, Joe Caldwell, was on Strange Paradise, they used this um, motif of um, of a haunted um, toy carousel to show when a ghost was about to appear or was somehow present. And it was a broken <clears throat> toy carousel. Mm -hmm. So some months later on Dark Shadows, there's a storyline where whenever a haunted toy carousel appears, there's a ghost that's about to appear. And Joe Caldwell, who had been writing very briefly for Strange Paradise, was dismissed pretty quickly by Bob Costello. And Joe Caldwell himself doesn't remember just why Bob dismissed him. I guess they had an argument about something Joe wanted to write. And Bob said, oh, we can't do that because we don't have the budget. And I think that happened two or three times. And I think it was probably a relief to Caldwell when he was taken off Strange Paradise because he had other, um, other things to do anyway, but um, but yeah, it's uh, quite quite no notice noticeable that that um, toy carousel reappears in Dark Shadows several months later. So I think I think it's interesting that so many people think it's it's ripping off Dark Shadows when, like you just said, uh, they clearly were watching Strange Paradise and borrowed. In fact. I often wonder what Dan Curtis's opinion was of Strange Paradise, and did he think that they were just <clears throat> ripping off his show? Um, that's a good question. It's so um, striking how the original impetus that Dan Curtis had to do Dark Shadows was a dream that involved a young woman on a train traveling to a big house. And... So Victoria, Dark Shadows was originally the story of Victoria Winters. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm very excited that you're writing the origin story for Victoria Winters, because her story was the seed that grew into Dark Shadows. But um, I think Dan Curtis, my perception of him is that he was pretty, I would say, hard-nosed, you know, very practical. And I'm also not sure how much time Dan Curtis had to actually watch TV because during the period that we're discussing of 1969, 1970, Dan Curtis was a very busy man. And um, there were times when he was in the producer's office at Dark Shadows. And when he was there, he was actually the head writer. This has never been actually stated as such, but Dan took on himself the task of directing how the plot lines were going to go, which is the job of the head writer. I think Sam Hall somehow, sometimes described himself as, in interviews as the head writer of Dark Shadows, but that really wasn't his job title. And um, so I don't really know how much time Dan had to watch Strange Paradise. He might have watched an episode or two, but one can only speculate what he would have thought. Right. And for all we know, he actually had his writers watching Strange Paradise to mm -hmm. get those to get those ideas. Well, as, as you know, um, Danielle and I like to talk about the horror Rolodex that they had on, in the Dark Shadows production office. <laughs> And we've, we've wondered what happened to the horror Rolodex. We really want to see it. <laughs> because we are very curious about all these different bits and pieces that they drew upon. I mean, Dark Shadows was like a plot, a plot, a uh, black hole, a plot, mo cookie monster or whatever. They just were always like in 1968, you can really see at some point, they're really struggling to come up with more plot. For dark shadows that the summer of 1968 storyline it's like throw everything but the kitchen sink into dark shadows right no matter how ridiculous and that's <clears> why <throat> even though i love the 1968 storyline because that was the storyline that i first was watching as a viewer um the writing when i look at it now the writing is sometimes so inconsistent for the characters I think in Strange Paradise, the writing for the characters tended to be more consistent because um, the plotting 
you know, maybe the plotting got crazy sometimes, but um, it just seems like there was more consistency, it, except then, you know, later on on Strange Paradise, they retcon to the point where it makes a complete nonsense of the earlier storyline. The final 13 weeks, the, right. the retconning gets so ridiculous that you just have to like, let lie back and let it wash over you. you can't say <laughs> wait that doesn't like when they bring back the ghost of shock yes it, i was just thinking the retconning that. is just not yeah good. it's just it's like what about everything that took place before mm -hmm. i really wish ian martin could have stayed on because he had a lot of great ideas that just were not incorporated uh who's just who knows what he was going to do with Jacques and how that would have been I think at one point I know this is I know we're kind of diving into other things that we weren't really going to touch on today but in one of the episodes and this actually was after Ian left the show but they mentioned this clock uh yeah I think it was I want to say like episode 61 or 60 <clears throat> pardon me 62 or 63 where um um erica and jacques are having a conversation and she mm -hmm. asks jean she asks jacques so what happens with jean paul when you take over his body and jacques responds with it's similar to the clock at now it was then fort fort desmond instead of desmond yeah. hall uh he's he's like stuck in suspended animation in this in this clock just like not moving and it's like now that's an interesting idea that i wish they would have just done more with and rather than just gloss over it yes i have ideas i mean I, not only am i working on the cursed dwellings with that's going to uh address the victoria's origin story but um when I do Strange Paradise Reborn, which I've worked on a little bit, um, that clock is going to be part of it. Oh, I, that's that sounds exciting. I love that reference to that clock. And um, later on, um, it reminded me of a clock in a story by H.P. Lovecraft called Through the Gates of the Silver Key which I wondered if whoever wrote that episode had read that story because there's a very strange clock in that story that's a portal to another world dimension. And I, I mean, there have been magic clocks in other stories as well. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think it's such a cool idea. And I'm excited that you're going to work on Strange Paradise Reborn, yeah. is it? Yeah, yes. Yeah, I uh, actually had worked on that years ago. I had three episodes of that, mm -hmm. but um, I've decided that I'm going to take Strange Paradise and tweak it and do like a continuation slash reboot in a way. I'm starting over because I was thinking about taking all of the episodes and just turning them in. Uh, creating them as audio dramas but then I thought no 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 some things just aren't going to work so I want to take these these ideas and just start from the beginning because then that way people don't necessarily have to start watching the original episodes to understand what I'm talking about mm -hmm. um, going back to Jacques and Jean-Paul and the possession thing because I know that uh that's kind of our topic for today. Um, what, and then I, I don't think they bring this up in the series, at least not episodes one through 44, unless I'm just not remembering. What caused Jacques to become so evil? I mean, they touched on at one point, and I, I can't remember what episode this was, but he's talking to Allison, possessed, possessing, uh, Jean-Paul and he's talking to Allison uh, Erica's sister and he's telling her this story about how his wife died yes and actually in a similar way to like 
to the way Josette died. Yes. But, but um, do you think that was what led him into being so corrupted or did they just kind of, they never really develop him in a way that uh, could answer a lot of these questions. I mean, do they? They just kind of leave it up to the imagination of the audience. Right. Um, well, again, I think that Jacques' backstory was going to be fully fleshed out in the flashbacks to 1680. And then the producers said, no, we can't do these flashbacks anymore. And so that really cut Ian Martin's legs off from under him as a writer because he had planned very carefully to, sh to reveal different elements of what had happened. That episode, it's episode six, when um, they're on the sofa and Jacques is telling the story, his version of the story of how uh, Huaco, his wife, died, that it was an accident, that the wind pushed her off the cliff. And when I was watching it again, it really made me wonder, did that like, was that really how it happened? And then, but then Raxel, so the relationship between Raxel, who's over 300 years old, there's at least two characters in the story who are over 300 years old, Raxel and the conjurer man, who's only in a couple of episodes. And initially you don't know how they've lived so long. And um, it's um, the, the, uh, in the Dorothy Daniels novels, and I think it's hinted at in a couple of the scripts. Originally, Raxel seems to have been the servant to the princess Huaco, who was an Inca princess or from some other Mesoamerican culture, um, who was taken by Jacques as his bride. And so there's obviously meant to be backstory where Raxel took revenge over the death of her mistress. And she, her perception was that he had killed Huaco. And then after Huaco's death, Jacques began putting the moves on her sister, Raua, whose reincarnation is Dr. Allison Carr. It gets very complicated. Mm -hmm. And all of that just like gets, this just gets forgotten after episode 20. They just stop referring to all of that, but that was gonna be part of the backstory was how these relationships repeat themselves in the thread of something happening in the present day, which is 1969 in the show. Um, and, um, and there's a lot of emotions. And, and then later on, <clears throat> they write more stuff to show how evil Jacques is. But the way that um, Colin Fox, who was just a genius at doing this, one of, the, um, one of the assistant directors for the show when I interviewed him in 2002 told me that Colin Fox had his own sense of continuity when he was working on the show. And he said he remembered uh, they were about to start shooting the day's episode and Colin said, oh no, I have to be wearing this ascot because that's what I was wearing when we stopped yesterday. So he kept track of things like that. And the way Colin plays Jacques, you know, he's lecherous and he's sly and he loves talking about the devil. Like there's this hilarious scene where he's like, oh, she's falling into the clutches of the devil. <laughs> that's little old me. On Dark Shadows, they would never have done something that sly and arch. You know, it really has a very different flavor to it. But I definitely feel Jacques is a more ambiguous or ambivalent character than the um, the promos. And, and Raxel, of course, is always like, you devil from hell. And I mean, <laughs> yeah. well, that's in her eyes because in her eyes, he, he killed her mistress. Did he really kill her? Was it an accident? When that happened, did that like drive him insane because he had loved her so much? We, you know, this would have unfolded in the narrative if it had been the way the writer planned it, but the producers decided, no, we're not gonna do that. And then 
you know, so there are these unanswered questions. So I think it's great that you want to do a reboot. Yeah, I uh, basically I came up with the idea because of what we talked about earlier regarding the uh, the issue with the last thirteen weeks. Mm. But that's a topic for another another time. Mm -hmm. I don't want to. I Raxel is a whole nother subject. You know, we 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 could talk about Raxel. It's dangerous to encourage me to talk about Raxel because in some ways she's my favorite character on the show. And uh, because of my personal metaphysical beliefs, I'm very interested in the topic of Raxel's religion mm -hmm. and also the religion that she shares with Vanji. And I just love how Ian Martin wrote all of that. It's really quite fascinating. Right. And yeah, that we could we could just even talk about that in a in a in an episode where we just talk about Raxel and her religion and how mm -hmm. she uses her religion to address the situation of Jacques. Yes. Yes. Well, just name the time and place and I'll be there. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for talking with me today about Strange Paradise. And I look forward to talking to you again. Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. And I wish you all the best with your projects. Cursed Dwellings, a Dark Paradise Saga is a labor of love. A fan audio drama serial created by Rachel Pulliam set in an alternative universe where dark shadows and strange paradise meet. No monetary profit has been made from the creation of this saga. My name is Betty Hanscom, and tonight I return to the town I once called my home. Collinsport. There I will be embraced by family and surrounded by friends. Oh, there I will be safe from the past, free from the mistakes I made years ago, and ready to bury myself in a place where I hope not to be found. Among the inhabitants of Collinwood. Haven't you buried yourself inside that bottle long enough? <laughs> I can only think of a couple of occasions when society gives permission for a man to drown himself with liquor. A wedding or a funeral. And, considering how Mr. Stoddard is unlikely to propose to you any time soon, at least if he knows what's good for him... What does Paul have to do with any of this? And I don't know why you and everyone else is talking funerals when there won't be one. Be sensible, Elizabeth. We both heard Dr. Reeves' diagnosis. It's time to face reality. Our father is not long for this world. Uh, yes, Bennett? Is he still with us? He's asking for you. Liz, try to relax, and I'll be back down when I know... No, sir. He's asking to see Miss Elizabeth. Thank you, Bennett. Thank you, Bennett. Of course he would choose you over me. Roger, why can't you be more responsible like your elder sister? Oh, my Elizabeth will go off to do great things. She will become head of the household one day. Well, I'm afraid that day is approaching fast. I just wonder if you're really up for the task. What do you mean by that? That should be obvious. You don't want him to die because you don't want to be shackled to this house any more than I do. That isn't true, and you know it. <laughs> we'll find out soon enough. Go on, Liz. Go ahead and see what the old man wants. I'll never understand how you can be so callous. Maybe you should ask him. <laughs> Thank you. 
I don't understand why you have to go away at all. There are plenty of opportunities right here in Collinsport. Oh, yes, I know that, Dad. But haven't you always said I needed to pave my own way? To create my own path? Don't twist my words, Betty. I'm not. Oh, look, you always said you wanted the best for me. Now, is the best really waiting tables all day at the Collinsport Inn? It's a respectable living. And I'm not disputing that. But it's not what I want to do. All right. What is it, then? How do you expect to go off and find yourself without a steady income? I saved a little, and, and when it's gone, I'll manage. I'll figure it out, Dad. I wouldn't be much of a father if I didn't worry about you. Miss? Did you hear what I said? Oh. I'm sorry. No, I didn't. I was asking if you were troubled. You seemed a million miles away. I suppose I was. Next stop, Collinsport. Next stop, Collinsport. You folks needing a place to stay? We've got several vacancies here at the inn. You also might want to help yourself to our famous lobster rolls. They're not to be missed. And if that doesn't grab you, head down a few blocks to the Blue Whale. It's one of the most happening spots in town. We've got popular tunes in the juke, and the first class is on the house if you're new in town. Okay. You said we were going to Salubrious Falls! No, I said you may think it was like Salubrious Falls. Now, no more arguments. Why, if it isn't my old friend and co-worker... Oh, it's good to see you again, Victor. Is your father picking you up? Uh, no. He doesn't know I'm here yet. <laughs> well, you know I can keep a secret. How may I help you, sir? I'd like to check into my room, please. It should be under the name McGuire. Elizabeth, is that you? I'm here, Father. Uh, are you alone? He isn't with you. Roger, I left him downstairs. Good. <laughs> what I have to say is for you alone. What is it? <laughs> Long ago... On my grandmother's deathbed, my father was meant to hear her secret. A secret our family has kept for generations. Father, you're not going to die. Don't interrupt! But my grandmother, Edith, died before she could reveal to my father what the secret was. And your grandfather died before learning what what he was meant to do to prevent a great evil from sweeping over our town. You aren't making any sense. What do you want me to know? I can't prevent that eventuality. But I ask you to heed my advice. Don't marry Paul Stoddard. What? I've seen into his heart, and I know it is not of goodness. He will destroy you, and perhaps even this whole family. You should have married Armand Desmond when you had the chance, before he changed his mind and married another. Paul hasn't even asked me to marry him yet, but if he does, it'll be my decision. And whether that's right or wrong, I... You will live. To regret it, Elizabeth. Mark my words. You will be your ruin and the cause of much unhappiness. Father? Father, I... Oh, no! Roger! Roger! <laughs> Thank you.
How about under Paul Stoddard? <laughs> Best to try Collinwood if you want to speak with him. He's been living it up with his girl on the hill. Believe me, I will. <laughs> I'd hate to be Paul Stoddard right now. I had no idea Elizabeth was going with anyone. Oh? Your father hasn't supplied you with the latest town gossip? <sighs> well, I... I didn't exactly make myself available. I'm curious why you came back. You were so adamant back then about leaving. Called this place stifling, if recollection serves me. Did you run out of money? No, no, I... I... I felt it was time to make amends. Aye. With Mr. Jameson Collins on death's door, that's bound to make anyone feel guilty about their own family life. It really puts things into perspective, doesn't it? <gasps> Jameson Collins is... I'm afraid so. Dr. Reeves was in earlier and gave me the news. We'll have to catch up later. Hey, you don't want a room? No. I'll be staying at Collinwood. Roger! Roger! Elizabeth, what is it? Had I known he was so close to slipping away, I would have given him a better send-off earlier. Oh, Mr. Jameson. It was such an honor to serve you. No need to stand on ceremony, Bennett. Please go downstairs and phone Dr. Reeves. Inform him of what happened. I imagine he'll want to come here straight away and confirm what we already know. On second thought, go and answer the door and send him up. Yes, sir. Tell me, dear sister, what did our father share with you alone that he couldn't share with me? Not now, Roger. You insist on keeping me in suspense. It didn't concern you. And while I'm now head of this household, it never <laughs> will. Oh, that's what he wanted to discuss. How practical of him. Leave it to Jameson Collins to look over his will with his favorite child. I suppose he left me nothing. How can you? Our father barely lies cold in his bed and you want to talk inheritance? Of course not. I suppose we should go over his funeral arrangements. But I'll leave that to you, Liz. Since you are head of the family now... Betty? Dad? Dad, I've come home! First Dwellings, a Dark Paradise Saga was created by Rachel Pulliam for Soul Twin Audios and is a work of fan fiction. No monetary profit has been made from the creation of this saga. The cast in order of appearance were Rhiannon McAfee as Betty Hanscom, Nathan Waltering as Roger Collins, Meredith Jones as Elizabeth Collins, Peter Wyshynski as Bennett Hanscom, Jake McCaskill as Victor Wells, Adam Blanford as Jason McGuire, and Justin Fife as Jameson Collins. The music was composed and performed by Ross Bernhardt with sound effects from freesound.org. I'm Bruce Busby, and I invite you to join us again next month. Cursed Dwellings, a Dark Paradise Saga is copyrighted by Rachel Pulliam in 2022. If you'd like to participate and discuss Dark Shadows or Strange Paradise in the next episode, please get in touch with me either on Facebook or Twitter at Soul Twin Audios. I will be discussing Angelique the Witch and Raxel the Voodoo Priestess. You will also hear Episode 2 of Cursed Dwellings. 
And speaking of cursed dwellings, it's time to reveal the winner of the first Walk On World contest. Thank you all who commented on the trailer with a name. I gave it quite a bit of thought, and the name that fits the best was thought up by Leif Shimmer, who wrote, I think Chalco would be a fun name, as a nod to really diehard fans of Strange Paradise. Congratulations! To learn more about Strange Paradise, please check out strangeparadise.net, Mel Jardin blog, Michelle's Garden of Evil. For Dark Shadows, please visit Patrick McRae's The Collinsport Historical Society. Listen to Penny Dreadful's Terror at Collinwood podcast. Resident of Collinwood podcast on YouTube, Between the Shadows podcast. Dark Paradise is a Soul Twin Audios production hosted by Rachel Polium. Ross Bernhard composed the music with some incidental music by Storyblocks. Sound effects were by freesound.org. Special thanks to Penny Dreadful and Stephen Schutt for sharing their intense knowledge of Dark Shadows and Strange Paradise with me. Dark Paradise is copyrighted by Soul Twin Audios by Rachel Polium in 2022.